Okay, so it's a process of research, it's a process of discovery. It's not really something that you're doing to support your own beliefs or opinions. So, you know, if you're out there looking for information just to prove your own point, that's not necessarily really the spirit of research. The spirit of research is to discover new things, to learn new information. So there's a couple of different types of research. There's primary and secondary. Do not get this confused with primary sources and secondary sources. That's a different bird. So primary research, if you're doing primary research, you're conducting the actual research. You're administering surveys, you're doing human testing, you're uh, doing animal testing, you're conducting an experiment in the lab. That's what primary research would be. Today, we're gonna to be talking about secondary research. And really secondary research is when you're just trying to find research or information that other people have written. You're trying to find out what others have discovered on this topic. It's helpful when you're doing your own research if you pick a topic of interest, something that's actually of interest to you. It's also helpful if you can have enough time to do a little preliminary search to make sure that there's enough information out there before you actually have to commit to a topic with your professor. Because I have had students come to the reference desk and they've picked a topic and they're sort of committed to that topic and then they discover that there's not much information out there on that topic and it becomes very painful. So, the, you know, the easier you can make your life, the better. That's my mantra. So step one for research process is to develop a good research question. That's going to kind of lead you and direct you and help you um, find the good information if you can create a good research question. So I'm a research librarian, but outside of my job as a research librarian, I ask myself research questions almost daily. So here's an example of the types of research questions I ask myself. Where's the nearest Fuzzy's taco? What other shows did this actor play in? What's the COVID count at TCU? How do I play video sound on Kahoot? And what is research? So I want you to take a minute and just jot down a few questions that you may have asked yourself this week or recently. They can be academic or personal. Um, and if you want to, you can put them in chat. Bogie's kind of monitoring chat for me. And so she can kind of shout out some of the ones that are being answered. And if you jot it down, we're actually going to come back to this later. So it'll help you remember. Did you want us to send like oratorical questions or do you want to just keep it to ourselves? Uh, you, you can share in chat if you want to. Um, you can just put your question in chat. If it's something that you don't want to share, you don't have to. You can just jot it down for yourself. But if you want to share, throw it up in chat and I'll um, not throw it up in the sense of vomit, but write it in chat. <laughs> And I will share it with the group. <laughs> Good question. Thank you. Okay, so what makes a good research question? I'm giving you all these questions I sort of ask myself, but what would make a good research question? Well, one thing is you don't want your research question to be biased. You, if your question is, I want to prove, or, um, you know, I'm trying to prove this is my opinion, you're biased. And so if you can get bias out of your research question, it's very helpful. Uh, sometimes that can really get in your way if you've got bias in your question. I've had students come in with a biased question and they can't find information on it because it's biased, because maybe their viewpoint isn't really supported in the literature. So um, it's much easier if you can take the bias out. You don't want something that's too broad or too narrow for your paper. It depends on the length of your paper. But, you know, if you've only got a um, three to five page paper, you can't cover the history of mankind. You've got to narrow it down some. You don't want your question to be vague. You want it to be clear what you're, or what you're looking for. And you want to be sure that you're asking for what you really want. You don't, and, uh, for example, you don't want to be asking for data if you really want an article that talks about some of that data. And as you research, research is a cyclical process. So as you start your research, you're going to discover more information, which may change your research question a little bit as you're going along. Um, so just be aware that that's going to happen. I want you to keep this slide in mind, the bias, too broad or too narrow, not vague, 
ask for what you really want, because I'm going to give you some examples of these in the next slide, and I want you to kind of take note to yourself. So step two is to refine your research question. And that refinement is really based on this. You want to kind of look at your question and go, am I biased? Is this question too broad? Is it too narrow? Is it vague? What am I really wanting? Kind of think about those things as you look at your research question that you initially jotted down. So here are some examples of academic research questions. And um, most of these I'm, I've tweaked them a little bit so that um, the names of the innocent will not be uh, revealed. But these are actual questions that I've you know, heard at the reference desk. So I need to find some information about World War I. What are housing prices for Texas? How are masks ineffective at preventing COVID? I need to find information on the market for car parts. And how has the trade war impacted subsidy payments for farmers? So look at those and see if you just, to yourself, see if you think there's any that are too broad, that are biased, that may be too narrow, maybe they're asking for something they don't want, maybe it's vague, kind of just take note to yourself of what you think. So I need to find information on World War I is too broad. That's a book, that may be several books. <laughs> uh, or that could cover just a plethora of topics. You could be talking about weapons. You could be talking about the economic impact. You could be talking about uh, military strategies. There's just a lot of different subtopics within that. And so you need to narrow it down. That would be a, an example of something that you need to narrow down. What are housing prices for Texas? I literally, there's no way for you to know this, but I literally had a student ask me a similar question to that this week. And when I sent that student the pricing information, they came back and said, well, I really didn't want just the data. I was wanting some articles that talked about that type of data. So that's an example of, you know, kind of being aware of what it is that you're really wanting and structuring your questions so that you're asking for what you really want. How are masks ineffective at preventing COVID? That's biased. You've got an opinion just sort of built into that question. So a better way to ask it might be, um, what does research show about the effectiveness of masks? And you've taken the bias out of it. And it kind of opens it up a little bit more for you. I need to find information on the market for car parts is vague. The part of it that's vague is the word market because market could mean that you're looking for consumer information. It could mean that you're looking for a list of competitors and you want to know who owns the most market share. It can mean several different things. And so it's a little bit vague as to exactly what you might be looking for. And then the final one, how has the trade war impacted subsidy payments for farmers is actually a pretty good research question. You'll notice that some of these are not in the forms of questions. Some of these are in the forms of statements. I think that's okay. If you can't flip it into a question, I think that's okay. But it's, I think it also works better to actually have it in the form of a question. Somehow or another, that sort of helps your mental attitude and the mental process when you're doing research. Once you get your question, the next thing is to pick a good starting point. So when I say pick a good starting point, I mean pick a starting point that is most likely to answer your research question. And um, especially with academic research, Google is not always the best starting point. So there's a couple of ways to go about picking a good starting point, and we're going to kind of cover these in more details after the slide. But the first one is to categorize your research question. So think about your question in terms of college majors. Is this a biology question? Is this a psychology question? Is this um, a theatrical question? What type of question is this? When you walk up to the research help desk and you ask me a question, especially if it's outside of my subject areas, the first thing I'm doing is categorizing that question in my mind to try to help me figure out where I need to start looking for your answers. And then the next thing is to think about formats, um, books, journals, magazines, etc. And the reason I'm saying to think about formats is because different formats do a better job of answering certain types of questions. And so I'm going to talk about that first, actually, in more detail. So I did some actual searches for specific formats on the topic of small scale farming. So 
So if that was your topic and you looked for books, this is an actual book that I found. The book coverage tends to be broader and it tends to cover the basics. And then probably a negative is it's not going to be as current as some of the other formats. But when you see the title of the book, The Complete Guide to Small Scale Farming, everything you need to know about raising beef and dairy cattle, rabbits, ducks, and other small animals, like it's pretty much just covering all the animals that you could small scale farm with and talking about that. Um, sometimes just the type of question somebody, if you're asking me to find some basic information about a topic, usually I'm trying to find a book for you because a book does a better job of sort of covering the basics of a topic of kind of giving you that foundational information of any of the formats that are out there. Websites tend to have basic coverage of a topic. They often tend to not have really deep coverage of it. Uh, sometimes there can be reliability issues. You don't know whether or not it's a good resource or if it's reliable information. And sometimes a lot of websites out there are biased. So you may be getting biased information which can create problems in, in your research. So when I did small scale farming and I found this website, you can see it's fairly basic. Um, you get the about small scale farming and it, you know, there's farm to you, do you put your hundreds of miles away? You can see it's just sort of, you know, talking to a, a very basic level of information. And then it's got a resources tab at the top. It's got videos. It's got um, about small scale farming, but there's not just a ton of stuff in the navigation tab at the top of that website. Journals tend to be very specific and they're also written at a much higher level of reading level. So a journal article is going to assume that you know the jargon in the field that you're researching and that you know, you're reading at a college level. So the journal article that I found was Wireless Sensor Network for Small-Scale Farming Systems in Southwest Iran, Application of Q Methodology to Investigate Farmers' Perceptions. Like that gives me a headache just reading that sentence to you. <laughs> but it gives you a very good idea of how specific journal articles can be. So if you're kind of trying to figure out just the basics of what is small-scale farming, a journal is not going to be a good place to start because it's diving deep and it's, you know, diving pretty heavy into the topic. Magazines tend to give you basic coverage. They're easy to read. They tend to be practical in nature. <clears throat> practical small scale farming and gardening lifted and garden up. You may find interviews in a magazine. You may find advertisements. You may find some how-to articles in magazines. So that's the type of information you can expect from that format. And then newspapers tend to have basic coverage, but it's also the most current because those are published daily. So if you're looking for something that, you know, is the most current information on the topic, a newspaper may be the place to go. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, newspapers also will provide you, if you are looking at small, if you want to find information about small scale gardening in Fort Worth, newspapers are going to be the format that will give you more local, local, you know, information geographically. So a newspaper would be a good place to start for that. And our databases contain journals, magazines, newspapers, and some eBooks also, as well as other formats. I'm really kind of covering the basics of formats right now. So let's go back to the research questions that I had earlier. And remember, I told you that the second that's part of what finding a good starting point is to categorize the question. And you probably do this <coughs> subconsciously every day when you're looking for information. So if I'm looking for the nearest fuzzies tacos, I'm not Googling that. I'm probably gonna go into ways because I've categorized that in my head as a directional question. And I'm gonna go into that app so that I can find the directions to it. If I want to know what show an actor played in, I'm categorizing that as a theater movie question, and I'm going to go to the IMBD website. COVID count at TCU, I've categorized that as a TCU question, and I'm going into the TCU website. And all that's doing is making my search more efficient. I'm going to the source that's most likely to give me the answer right away. And you do see that on a couple of those, I go on Google. So, 
here's one of our research questions, our academic research question. And I want you to type in chat or unmute yourself and tell me what categories this question might fall into. And again, think about your college majors. So how has the trade war impacted subsidy payment for farmers? So subsidy payment would be that, you know, they produce a ton of wheat and they can't sell all that wheat and the government's gonna come in and pay them for that wheat that they couldn't sell so that they don't just lose all their money and can continue to farm and produce our food for us. So what kind of categories? Are we getting anything on chat? Business. Business. Yeah, because there's trade war information. What else? Agriculture. Agriculture, definitely. Because that's more. What? Government. Government, yes. All right, yeah, political science, economics, which is sort of business, agriculture, what else? International relations. Yeah, international relations. <clears throat> so those kind of give me starting points, you know, when I go, oh, I might want to look at, you know, political science databases. Then what I do is when you go on the library website, you go to the databases, there's a browse by subject topic box, and I'm going to show you this live when I get out of PowerPoint. But I can go into political science subject area, or I can go into economic subject area, and it just pulls up the databases for that subject. And so that's narrowing down my starting point for me. It's giving me a better um, chance of you know getting good information right out of the gate. Step four is to search by keywords. Well, we're in Google, we've really been programmed with Google to search in fragment, sentence fragments, or, you know, how do I get to fuzzies? How far is Austin from San Antonio? You know, we sort of search like we talk, and most search engines work better if you just break down your search into keywords. So a keyword is typically a noun. You don't want to use prepositional phrases in the door, out the house with the dog, leave all that out of your search. Leave the words A and B out of your search. You know, get rid of any sentence fragments in your search. And then don't just get stuck on one word, think of synonyms. And then once you're actually doing your searches, start looking for hints in the article titles and the subject headings. And I'm gonna show you this live in a minute. And some of this will make a little bit more sense once we go live. But we have another search example. Should people be able to donate organs in exchange for money? So jot, go, jot down to yourself or put in chat what are some of the keywords that you could take out of that research question and put into a search? So you may have things like donate organs, money, words like that. <clears throat> um, and then if I'm not going to be literal, somebody chatted. Or donate organs for money. Donate organs for money. Now I get rid of the word for uh, because you know that's creating a prepositional phrase. What else? Cost of liver. Cost of what? Liver. Cost of liver. <laughs> Okay, yeah, great. You've gotten out of the question. What else? Sell organs money. Sell organs money. And cash. <laughs> and y'all be making some extra cash after this class. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do that search live in a few minutes, and we're going to kind of play around to see what happens to us when we do that. Uh, use search commands, and this, there's no point in me showing it to you uh, in a PowerPoint, we're going to go through this live, but there are some search commands that will help you with your searching, and, and that's where we're going to be playing a game in a minute. And then step six is to get help. 
So you can ask the subject librarian for your topic on the library homepage if you sort of scroll down below all the um, search boxes. There's an Ask the Librarian box on the right-hand side, and there's a link that says Find Your Subject Librarian. We love to help you with your research. It's a favorite part of all of our jobs. We all really like that you're not bothering us. That's what we enjoy doing. It actually helps keep us up to speed on what we need to order for resources for the library because we know if there's a gap. You know, if there's if you're asking me a question that I don't have resources that will find the answer to that question, then I know I've got a gap and I need to go find some resources and purchase them. So do feel free to you contact your subject librarian for help. And then we also have research guides um, at the very top of the library homepage. There's a tab for research guides. And again, those are broken out by subject. And the research guides tend to have links into our databases and then also some websites that we think are good. And it tends to be a little bit more tutorial in nature. So we're in the research guides, we're able to like, you know, sometimes provide instructions or put videos or provide additional information for you. All right. That is it for the PowerPoint. Any questions for me up to this point? Okay, I'm gonna go live. So we're going to take that question that we had earlier, should people be able to donate organs in exchange for money? And we're going to go to library databases, which is this tab right here. And remember, databases contain magazines, journals, newspapers, things of that nature. So we pay money for the databases. We're subscribed to them. So the type of information that you will find in the databases, you most likely will not be able to find out on Google. So you want to be sure that you're going through the library website to get to the databases. Otherwise, um, you won't be able to get into it because you haven't paid the fee. And again, we've got this browse by subject topic. So we categorized, you know, if you categorize that, should people be able to donate organs in exchange for money? Well, that could be a health question. <laughs> that could be a sociology question. There's some ethics around that. So maybe philosophy. And the groupings that I might pick are health and wellness. And then there's also a sociology grouping further down. So let's start with health and wellness. Now the nice thing once you get into a subject area is if there is a liaison assigned to that subject, you will have their info contact information over on the right hand side of the page. And there will be a chat box that you could, if they were online, you could just chat with them. You could IM that liaison right away. For every subject area that you choose in this drop box, at the very top, we have our best bets, which is the first two to four databases that we think are most likely going to answer your question on that topic. And in this case, it's health and wellness. And then after that, it just becomes a data, an alphabetical listing of the databases that have information on that subject area. And we try to give a little description next to each database so that you can kind of figure out whether or not it would be useful or a good place to start. So let's start in Health Source Consumer Edition. And I noticed that that's published by EBSCO Host. It's like having, um, EBSCO Host is the publisher. They publish a lot of databases. So it's like having the same publisher with different books. So Health Source Consumer Edition only contains magazines, journals, books that are about health. At, at a consumer level, you know, they're not expecting you to be a physician or a nurse in order to read it. But you can go over here to this choose databases. Once you're in one of the EBSCO host databases, you can go to choose databases. Because remember, we said it might also be a sociology topic. And so I can scroll down if it would let me scroll down. Will you let me scroll down?
and I can choose social index, which is a sociology database. So I can add that to my search. And I can also add in academic search ultimate, which is really a, what we would call a multidisciplinary search engine. It has lots of different subject areas in it and click okay. And then when I click the show all, I'm searching through all three of those databases at once. So I'm kind of trying to increase my odds a little bit there. And by the way, if you have questions as I'm going through this, throw it up in the chat. Bogie's monitoring the chat. She'll um, fly me down and let me know that we've got a question. Okay, so if we were to just put that question in as is, um, The EBSCO host databases will try to bring back results. It's sort of guessing because it doesn't really fully understand what you've asked it to do. And you see that um, motivations for donating to the police in Bulgaria, it's really not on topic. Um, donating organs and asking for postmortems. Um, the third one is on topic, but we're getting you know a, a mixture in there. And we have a 1,830 search results. So the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of all these prepositional phrases. And I'm just going to go for my key words, like we talked about earlier. So I'm just hitting search again. And it took it down to 18. Yes. Why did you put them in different boxes? So I, I, I we're going to get to that. Bogey asked me why I put it in different boxes, and we'll, uh, we're going to get to that when we do the search commands in a minute. So it went down drastically. We went from uh, 1,800 to 18. A little disappointing, but they're a little bit more on target, what we're seeing. Now, Here's where I, I talked to you about using synonyms. I wouldn't say donating organs. I would say organ donations. That's how. That's really probably more likely the key word. And now it went up to 137. And all I did was flip my word order, basically. So how you're searching is gonna make a big difference. All right, we are going to go, and we're gonna jump back and forth between this search so we're going to go through some search commands. Now I've got to move as far out of my way. And we're going to kind of talk about what search commands do and how to use them. And one of the first things I want to point out to you before we go into that is that almost all of our databases over on the left hand side have what we call limiters. So you can see that these results are going back to 1977. I can limit that date range and, and move it up if I'm not looking for the history of the topic. I would up that date range. I can limit it to just um, scholarly articles. If my professor is telling me I have to have a scholarly article, I can limit to just that. Um, there's a lot of different limiters that appear on the left side. You know, I got a lot of articles in another language. Unfortunately, I only read and speak English, so I can limit it to just English articles. So you can kind of play around with some of those limiters on the left side to help narrow down when you're doing a search. And when I do a search, my whole goal is to get the best stuff on this first page. I want to get the best articles on this first page because research shows that you're not going to go to page two. I rarely go to page two and I'm a librarian and this is what I do for a living. So if I have too many results, if I had like 20,000 results here, there's no way I'm going to look at 20,000 results. So I'm going to do some stuff to narrow down my search to make it more specific and to try to get better results showing up on this page. Conversely, if I only had 10 results, I would be a little sad <laughs> and I would be doing some things to try to get more results to show up on this page. So that's kind of the basic premise behind this little game. All right, so we're just going to go with classic mode because y'all are all on in your own spaces.
Let's get rid of the Kahoot music. So you want to go to kahoot.it. You'll probably need to use another device, your phone or something. And here's the PIN number. I know. I love the little heart. Oh, look at who has got little pumpkins for Halloween. Yay. Festive. <laughs> Looks like it's slowing down. By the way, next Wednesday, I'll just advertise while you're uh, all getting loaded in. Next Wednesday, we're going to have, we've been having um, tri pub trivia games in the library the past few semesters, and because of COVID, we can't have it live in the library, but we are going to have pub trivia via Zoom and the theme is Star Wars. So um, so Bogie's putting the link in the chat. If you want to um, play by yourself or form a team and play, email me and I will put you on the participants list. We will have prizes for the winners and it should be fun. First thing I'm going to do while we're getting loaded up is I'm going to um, start our search off more basically, and I'm just going to have it at organ donations. So I'm going to click search on that, and we're at 17,833. So we're always going to kind of notice how many results we have. And what I do when I'm actually searching for you is I kind of look at this number, and then I scan through that first page really quickly to see if it looks promising or not, if it looks like, you know, I've gotten on target or not on target, if it's too broad or it's too narrow. So that's kind of the premise of how we're going to play around. All right, looks like we've got everybody in there. Here we go, we're going to start. So here's the first question. What happens to results when you use quotation marks? Are they, do you get more results that are more specific, less results that are more specific, more results that are less specific, or less results that are less specific? specific so let's jump back over here we have organ donations anytime I have a phrase that's two or more words I put that in quotation marks because what that's telling the search engine to do is that it's telling the search engine that literally both of those words have to be right next to each other in the document in order for me to get that document back so we're at 17,833 right now when I put the quotation marks around it it dropped it to 10,000 so now I'm getting more specific articles. They should be more on topic and literally talking about organ donations. Without the quotation marks, I could get back an article that said, um, he played the organ at church and um, the congregation gave a lot of donations for the, for the concert, which is not what you want, that's just junk. So use quotation marks, two or more words, and it's going to give you more specific search results. It's going to narrow it down.
All right, let's see who's in the lead. Anderson. All right, next question. What happens when I or a keyword to my search? Do I get more results that are more specific, less results that are less specific, or less, less, less? Went through that fast after the first time. Ooh. Like I skipped a question here. Oh, good job. All right, I'm going to get more results. It's going to be less specific. But this is the biggest mistake that people make. They get you get a word in your head, or there's a word that your professor has put on the syllabus, and that is the word that you're using to search. And that may or may not be the word that they're using in the literature. So don't get, you know, don't get brain locked. Don't get stuck on just one word. Now, one thing that I do and that I like about the EBSCO host like um, databases is that it has the subjects tag to articles. So if I found a really good article, I could look at the relevant tags and maybe go up and change my search. So one of the tags that I saw earlier when I was playing around with this on my own was um, sale of organs. So I'm going to put that as a phrase. We're at 10,186. And it went up about 400. We're at 10,500. Sometimes it's very dramatic how much it will increase. Sometimes it's not. It just depends on the topic. So we got more results back when we bored. So or means more. That's my brilliant rhyme for today. Uh oh, Anderson, drop down. Marcus C is up. All right, here we go. Next question. What happens when I add a keyword to my search? More, more, less, more, more, less, less, less. Oh, that split the crowd. You're going to get less results. It's going to be more specific. And I think this confuses everybody because um, if I told you to go to the grocery store and get apples and bananas and oranges, your list would be getting bigger. So intuitively, that's not how we use the word and. But when you're in a database and you and a term together, so I'm going to add and in money, and let's just pretend we have organ donations and money. What I'm telling the search engine is that both the phrase organ donations and the word money have to be in the document in order for me to get it back. So you're always going to get less results when you answer. So we went from 10,087. Now, money may not be the word that they're using. So I'm going to or in payments to it. And it went up to 175. Or incentives. Maybe. So you see, I'm oring synonyms. It's not literally synonyms all the time. Like I might or if I'm searching for information on social media, I might say or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. And those aren't literal synonyms for social media, but they're getting at the same concept. I'm trying to get at the same idea. So that's how I use the or to get more, and then and is going to get you less. All right, let's see. Marcus C. Mark, oh, Bogey jumped in the lead. That's cheating. She's a librarian. <laughs> All right, here we go. So, Anderson, you're back. You're back, Anderson. We're counting you as number one. What happens when I put this symbol and asterisk at the end of a word? So, for example, finance. Do I get more results? Less, more, less, less, less.
You're going to get more results. They're going to be less specific. Now, quotation marks will work in Google or works in Google. You don't need the and in Google because Google's automatically anding everything that you type into it. So let's go in and put the asterisk. I'm going to drop the S off this word. Okay, well, I'm going to not be able to use my keyboard correctly for this term. I'm going to drop the S of that, off of that. I'm going to drop the S off of organs. I'm going to drop the ES off of incentives. We're at 392 results right now. And it went up. 5,462. Sometimes it's very dramatic how much it goes up. So you may be wondering, what is that asterisk doing? Well, if I did the word finance and I put the asterisk in, what it's telling the search engine is to look for all the variations of that word that exists. So it might look for finance, finances, financing, financial, all those variations in one search. If I were looking for articles about women, and I didn't know if it was saying women or woman, I could put the asterisk right there and it would look for both women and woman. So the asterisk is sort of acting as a wild card and it's looking for variations of a word form. And I use that a lot when I search that is the one search command that will not work in Google because Google's already trying to sort of do that, this concept for you. But it, I use this a lot in our databases because the databases are literal. It literally looks for the word that you type into it. So if you type in dog, you only get articles that have the word dog repeating at a high rate. You don't get any of the articles that are repeating dogs with an S. And so you can go and Google and type in dog and dogs. And even in Google, you'll be getting a little bit different results, different images, and a few different articles. So search engines are literal. And so that gets away from that literalism by using the asterisk. All right, be done, risen up. What happens when I'm not a keyword to my search? More, more, less, more, more, less, less, less. Oh, good job. I'm going to get less results. It's going to be more specific. I rarely use the word not. Where I use it is if I have a word that has more than one meaning. For example, the word mint, M I N T. I could be getting articles about the U.S. Treasury, or I could be getting articles about chewing gum. What so the fuck? Those I don't want. So I, then I might say not gum. Or I might say not U.S. Treasury, not money. So I might play around with that. The other time that I use the word not is if I'm doing a search on a topic that's um, uh, it's kind of what I call the, a soft topic, like the language around it is not real specific. So, so for example, leadership. You can find tons of articles on leadership, but it doesn't have, you know, when you're looking for a specific concept, often there's not like really precise language about certain concepts within leadership. So then I might kind of scroll through my search. I might be like, well, you know, I feel like my search is good overall, but I'm still getting, you know, these pieces of noise in my search results. And I'm really not interested in that. So, you know, maybe cadavers, I'm not interested in that. So I could go in, I can spell cadaver. And I'm gonna say not, Cadaver. I'm going to asterisk it so it'll get rid of the variations. I'm at 462 and it went down to 414. So it got rid of all, you know, that subject area in it. And by the way, that's another good place to look for keyword options in the titles of the articles and in these subject headings or the tags that are on it. All right, last question. Oh, Vivan is holding. All right. What happens if 
finding the same search in Business Source Complete and Factiva, so two different databases. Do I get the same results, mostly the same results, completely different results, or mostly different results? Okay, so I accept it either completely different or mostly different. Uh, in reality, between those two databases, you would get completely different results. And what I want to show you is that the whole point of that question is that different databases, every database has to, I can't talk and type at the same time, I'm sorry. <laughs> Having technical difficulties over here. Every database contains different journals and different articles in it. So if I go into biology, just because it's high up there on the subject rankings, Web of Science and PubMed are not going to have the same journals and the same newspapers and the same magazines in them. It's going to be different. And so it may behoove you to do the same search in more than one database because you're going to get different results. You're going to find more information. So that's the whole point of that last question. So let's see who our winner is. Let's see if beat on, held on. And what happened to Anderson? Tay, just out of nowhere, Tay came in. Beat on, number two, who's number one? Stephanie, just out of the blue, good job. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna see if you guys have any questions for me on any of that. So basically you wanna create a research question, you wanna refine it, make sure it's not biased, you know, have a good starting point. You wanna pick keywords out of that research statement. You want to use some of these search commands that we just talked about. Pick a good starting point. Use some of these search commands that we just talked about. And then if you get stuck, get some help. Yes, sir. Uh, when you're finished, please make sure the projectors are involved. Okay, well, thanks for attending. We are glad that you guys, you know, took your time out of your busy schedules to come in and learn a little bit about research. Like I said, if you have any questions, do feel free to contact me or Bowie or, you know, your research librarian preference. And y'all have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you. much. Have a Thank good day. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, they stopped recording. Mm -hmm.